Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to thank the uh, wonderful choir for that special music. My heart has been touched. Let's give them another hearty amen. 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 Thank you for your commitment and your dedication in using your gifts and your talents for the Lord. It's good to be back here at the, uh, this church. Some time ago, while I was waiting for my connection flight, I walked into this bookstore while I was waiting and came across this book. It was a very interesting book. The book was entitled, One Thing. One Thing. But what really caught my attention was the subtitle to this book that read something like this. It read, The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results. The Surprisingly Simple Truth behind extraordinary results. And as a person, I'm, I'm pretty result-oriented, I'm pretty result-driven, and I like to see tangible results when I'm running evangelistic meetings or when I'm doing anything for God. So it was really the subtitle that caught my attention. So I took the book and uh, I browsed through it and I downloaded it on my Kindle and I, and I read it all the way home as I was flying back to my final destination. You know, we live in, a, we live in an overstimulated society. From the moment we wake up to the moment we sleep, we are bombarded with a plethora of information. From the moment we wake up, we are bombarded with notifications, with messages, with text messages, with emails, with digital advertisements, and the list goes on and on and on. And because we are so overwhelmed with this plethora of information, there's a tendency to be distracted with so many things. And so this book uses science and research to prove the idea that it is possible to accomplish extraordinary results in your life if you just simply focus on one thing. If you just focus simply on one thing. And so this book uses research and science just to prove this thesis, this idea of one thing. Now, time does not suffice me to go through each idea that revolves around one thing. But I want to share with you a few things that caught my attention. I want to bring some redemptive value to these, uh, to these ideas. They noticed as they studied successful, wealthy business and people who have uh, influenced society. And they noticed that part of their success can be traced back to the fact that they focus on one thing. For example, Google, what's, what's their one thing? Searching. Starbucks, what's their one thing? Coffee. Subway, what's their one thing? Sandwich. You don't go into Subway and you see Taco Bell, and McDonald's and all these. No, 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 no. They just focus on one thing. And this idea not only, tra- not only exists in the business world, but it also translates into the sports world too. When you think of Tiger Woods, what is Tiger Woods' one thing? You see, at a very young age, Tiger Woods decided to, decided to make a decision as a young boy that he's going to focus his whole entire life into one sport, into one discipline, and that's golfing. And as a result, he became one of the most successful and talented golfers in all of history. One thing, if you just focus on one thing, you will produce extraordinary results. And it's interesting that there are um, some proverbs that kind of made me chuckle, but it illustrates the point in this book. It says, if you try to catch two rabbits, you will not catch either one. And some of us here today have more than two rabbits. We have five rabbits, six rabbits, seven rabbits. And if you're trying to catch all of these rabbits at the same time, you'll end up catching none of them at all. Another interesting quote that caught my attention in this book, be like a postage stamp. Stick to one thing until you get there. (laughs) Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, be like a postage stamp. Just stick to one thing until you get there. You know, I talk to many many students uh, here at Southern Adventist University, and I ask them, I say, hey, what are you doing? 
You know, what are you doing here at Southern? You know, what's the one thing that you're focusing on? Well, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm involved in this club and I'm involved in this club and, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm just doing all of these things. And I, and I challenged him. I says, look, by the time you end your education here at Southern, what is the one thing you wish to accomplish? What is the one thing you wish people to know about you? I had one student come into my office uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him that question. And, and with confidence and conviction, he says, Pastor Douglas, my one goal in life is to be an evangelist. And I said to my colleague when he left, I said, this guy's going places. Because his whole mind is dedicated to being an evangelist. He didn't say, well, I want to be an evangelist. I don't want to be a psychologist. I want to be a business. No, no, no. He says, I'm an evangelist, which simply means I'm not a nurse. I'm not a businessman. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a teacher. I'm an evangelist. I want to win souls for Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with these other disciplines. But whatever discipline that you're focused on, focus on that one thing. And life will take you places. It's interesting, when I was reading this book, it actually challenged some of my own positions, some of my own ideas when it comes to success. I always thought that in order to be successful, I needed to multitask. And in this book here, it, it, came, it said this statement, it, it almost fell off my seat, it said, multitasking is a lie. Again, this book uses science and research to back up its ideas. So it wasn't, and, 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 I, and I was hesitant to kind of, uh, mentioned this in, in this sermon because I know there are a lot of mothers out there. You know, mothers like to multitask. Can you say amen? You know, they, 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 cook, the they, cook, the, you know, they cook the chop chay. You know, then they, <laughs> then, they, then, they, uh, <laughs> then they have to shower the baby. You know, and they have to boil the water. Then they vacuum. And that's all great, but I can guarantee one of those things will be left out. Either your child or the chop chay or the vacuum. <laughs> you know, or the hot boiling water that's on the oven. One of them is going to be left out. And so it's very interesting that, that this book makes the bold statement that multitasking is all right. But let me put this into context. There is this thing called multitasking. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that the word that psychologists have been, uh, have been studying this idea of multitasking since the 1920s. But the word multitasking did not come into the scene until the 1960s. The word never existed before the 1960s. The first time you hear the word multitasking is in the 1960s, and when it first came out, it applied to computers. It never applied to human beings. It applied to computers, and that's, that's when we first hear the word multitasking. Well, anyway, here's some interesting facts. Now, now, there's nothing wrong with multitasking. What I'm simply presenting here as the book presents that multitasking is not as effective as focusing on one project at a time. In 2009, a study was put out that 16% of all traffic fatalities and half a million injuries a year is due to multitasking. Driving, just simply driving and talking, takes 40% of your focus from concentrating on driving. And according to this survey, that's almost the same effect as drunk driving. They did a study and they found that, uh, they studied companies and their employees, and they found that 28% of the day is lost to multitasking. Employees in this particular company are 28% less productive when they multitask. 28% less productive in this company when they multitask. Now, again, you know, this is the difference between multitasking and just doing one project at a time. And they found that those who just focused on one project at a time accomplished and produced more extraordinary results. And so this book brings out two simple examples of the ineffectiveness of multitasking. How many of you, how many of you would multitask doing this? <laughs> Does multitasking work? How many of you would walk down this tight rope, checking your emails, sending a text, you know, read, you know, reading a book and combing your hair and shaving all at the same time as you're trying to walk down this tight rope? It doesn't make sense. It won't happen. Or how many of you are willing to land a Boeing 747 while you're multitasking? 
It's important. How many of you would like to, how many of you would like to get on a plane when the pilot is multitasking as you're about to land that plane? Raise your hand. I have a friend who's a pilot. He said to me, he says, Doug, as pilots, once we get to the 10,000, once we get to the 10,000 feet barrier, uh, the rule is that we're not allowed to talk about anything with the co-pilots, just focusing on landing. Now, from 10,000 above, they can talk, they can joke, they can talk about their wives, they can talk about whoever. But from 10,000 below, they're just focusing on one thing, that's landing the plane. So when it comes to this thing called multitasking, it, it takes away the effectiveness of focusing on one thing. There's another interesting idea that this book brings out. It's the idea of dominoes. And the idea is that the principle called, is called the, the, the domino effect. Back in 1983, this physicist came with this theory and came up with this theory. And the theory goes like this. When you put a domino together, what a domino, no matter what the size is, could take down the next domino 50% larger than itself. So if you put a domino, that domino can take down the next domino that's 50% larger than itself. And the, and the second domino can take down the third domino that's 50% larger than itself. And the third domino can take down a, the fourth domino, which is 50% larger than the third. If that makes sense, can you say amen? amen? So then back in 2001, this physicist from San Francisco decided that he will put this theory into practice. And he purchased eight pieces of plywood. And the first piece of plywood was just simply two inches high. And then he applied the second uh, domino to be 50% larger, eight pieces, until it, get, until it got to the last piece of domino. And it's interesting that what started off as a simple flick to this two-inch plywood ended up with this huge three feet twice, three times the size of a two-inch plywood with a loud crash. What started off as a little flick ended up with a huge loud crash. And so this physicist decided to put this theory into practice, and that's what he did. And so he began to theorize that if this concept is true with just eight pieces of plywood, then, 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 what, then what are the ramifications if we just keep on going and going and going? And he came up with this theory. And the theory is this. If you start off with a two-inch domino, by the time you get to the 18th domino, you have enough momentum and energy to take down the leaning tower. By the time you get to the 23rd domino, it has created so much momentum, so much created so much energy, that by the time you get to the 23rd domino, you have enough energy and momentum to take down the Eiffel Tower. Using the same theory, by the time you get to the 31st domino, it has created so much energy that you can take down Mount Everest. And the theory goes that by the time you get to the 57th domino, you have enough power to take down the moon. Two inches, what starts off as a little flick, ends off with huge ramifications. Some of us here may be wondering to ourselves that one small sin doesn't matter. One small insignificant sin doesn't matter. But the more you continue to ponder, the more you continue to act on that sin, that one small sin has huge salvational effects on your life. One small domino, one small lie, one small cheat will keep you out from the kingdom of God. Huge ramifications. If it's not confessed and repented, if you come to Jesus, can you say amen? Well, interesting, this book, this book goes on to say that that as they, there were four things that rob people from focusing on one thing. Four things, but I'm going to mention to you one. One of the things that rob people from focusing on one thing is the inability to say no. People who can't say no cannot focus on one thing. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting that uh, Warren Buffett says, uh, says the following words here, if you notice on the screen. He says, 
The difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. Isn't that true? Because they want to focus on how many things? On just one thing. Just one thing. And unsuccessful people have this inability to say no. They want to say yes to this club. They don't want to say yes to that club. They don't want to say yes to this. They don't want to say yes to this. And they end up going, chasing all these rabbits, but focusing on that one call that God has called them to. As I read this book, the last, the last idea that this book brings out is that this whole book is, is built on one simple question. One simple question. And the question is this. What is the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? Have you asked yourself that when you go to work? When you go to work, ask yourself, look, what's the one thing that I can do? And if I just do this one thing, then all these other things become easier or unnecessary. As a matter of fact, when I get to X, Y, Z, I don't need to focus on that because I've tackled it right here in point number one. What is that one thing? And if you just focus on that one thing, then everything else in life becomes easier or even unnecessary. That's really the question that this book asks. I've entitled today's sermon, One Thing. Let us pray. Father in heaven, work a miracle today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was contemplating on this book, I had to ask myself, does God have one thing? Does God have one thing that he wishes for his people to focus on? Is there one thing in the Bible that God wants us to focus on? Secondly, as I was contemplating on this when it comes to spiritual matters, is, does the Bible speak of a domino effect? That if I just do this one little thing, it'll keep me out from heaven. Are there examples in the Bible of people who've lost their salvation because of their inability to say no? Are there people in the Bible who have caused so much problems and apostasy in God's church all because they did not have the courage to stand up and say no? And what is the one thing as Seventh-day Adventist Christians awaiting the soon imminent return of our Savior, what is the one thing we should be focusing on right now as Seventh-day Adventists that will prepare us for the second coming of Jesus? It's interesting to note, ladies and gentlemen, that the compound word, the two words joined together, one thing, is mentioned 16 times in Scripture. How many times did I say? 16 times. Now, though they refer to different contexts, but the word one thing, words one thing, is mentioned 16 times in Scripture. And I'm going to just share with you a few of them. First of all, it's found in the first time the word one thing is mentioned is Joshua chapter 23, verse 14. It reads, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not what, friends? One thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are coming to pass unto you, and not one thing has failed thereof. The context here is that the children of Israel were contemplating going back to paganism. They were contemplating leaving God. And so Joshua had to remind the children of Israel, if you're contemplating backsliding, remember a couple of things. Number one, you're going to be outside the protection of God. If you're contemplating going back to the world, just remember this one thing. When you gave your heart to Jesus and you became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, remember this one thing. God never failed you in one thing when it came to his promises. God was faithful and true in fulfilling all of his promises in your life. He has not failed you in one thing. And the same promise is true for you and I. We serve a faithful God who promises you that he will not fail you in any one thing. If that's clear, can you say amen? amen? That's what Joshua was talking about. Then we come down to the book of Psalms chapter 27 and verse 4. The Bible says, David says, one thing. Now the context here is that David was being pursued by Saul. And he says, one thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord 
all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You know, David could have asked for anything. He would have said, Lord, the one thing I ask is that you protect me from soul. But he didn't ask for protection. The one thing that he desired was to behold the sanctuary of God. The one thing he desired, if David was here today, would simply be, I want to understand more truth when it comes to the sanctuary message. That's the one thing that David desired. Then we come down to verse Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever, whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross. And what, friends? What should we do? We should... Follow Jesus. This is the story of the rich young ruler. This is the context. And the rich young ruler came to Jesus and says, Jesus, I've done all these things. But Jesus turns to him and he says, one thing thou lackest. You know, it's very interesting that it's sad to say, dearly beloved, that there will be many people who will lose out of heaven all because they have cherished one idol. I call them the one percenters. They have given up 99% of their heart. They have been faithful to 99% of the teachings of the Bible, but they still continue to cherish that one idol. And that one thing, that one small idol that you refuse to give and you refuse to confess is the one thing that will keep you out of heaven. One may say, well, you know, I'm a faithful vegan. Great. I'm a faithful Adventist. I return my tithes and my offerings. I keep the seventh day Sabbath, but I still hold on to that one pride. That one pride. I go to church every Sabbath. I dress the right way. I eat the right foods. I sing the right songs. But there's this one person I find hard forgiving. This one person I refuse to forgive. That's the one thing that may hold you back from all of eternity. And this was true of the, uh, with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, I've done all these wonderful things. I eat the right foods. I give to the right church. I keep the right day Sabbath. Jesus says one thing. Oh, what a sad case it will be if anyone here under the sound of my voice will lose out of heaven because of that one, that one thing. Then we come down to the book of Philippians, I believe. It's Paul. And he says, brethren... I count not myself to have apprehended, but this, what friends? One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. In other words, Paul is simply saying, I move forward. I move forward towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is simply saying here, look, I can move forward in life. By just focusing on one thing, forgetting the things in the past. You can never move forward in your spiritual walk if you're still holding on to grudges. You can never move forward in your sanctification, in your walk to become closer with God, if there's still someone in your heart and in your life that you refuse to forgive. And Paul is simply saying here, look, my one thing is to just let go of all these baggages, this hurt, this cheat, all of these bad things that's happened to me, I'm letting them go because heaven is my goal. That's the one thing that Paul focused on. I want Jesus to come back. How about you? You know, this week, I learned a new concept. The concept is straddling. A friend of mine uh, who's a professor at Southern, he sent me this article in the Harvard Business Review and uh, straddling is kind of like a cousin of multitasking. Look, you cannot multitask with God. And the, and the idea of straddling is this, if I may. <clears throat> the best, the best, the best, I, the best uh, explanation that this, this article, Harvard Business Review, uh, gave was when Southwest Airlines first came onto the scene, Southwest Airlines had one focus, cheap fares. How many of you flown Southwest? Cheap fares, amen? That was their one focus, cheap fares. Cheap fares. And in order for them to, in order for them to have cheap fares, there were certain trade-offs. They cut out 
you know, they cut out first class service. They cut out seat assignments. They cut out giving meals. They cut out all of these things. Why? Because they just want to focus on low fares, on one thing. Well, this rocked the aviation world because now all of the other competitors were losing money because this new kid on the block was stealing their customers. And so Continental Airlines decided to use this strategy in, 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 in business strategy called straddling. And the idea of straddling is simply to imitate another company without making changes to your current structure. So Continental Airlines decided to imitate Southwest without making any trade-offs on their end. Now, Continental Airlines back then was a full-fledged serviced airline. They had the meals, they had the first class, they had the baggage check-in, they had everything that Southwest didn't. And now they wanted the benefits of Southwest, and so they decided to add the model of Southwest to their model, and they found that the company that they, the subcompany that they created to compete with Southwest became bankrupt. Why? Because Continental was focusing on too many things. They wanted the benefits of Southwest, but they still wanted to give people food. They still wanted seating assignment. They still wanted, they weren't willing to make any trade-offs in their own company to become like Southwest. And you know, as I thought of this concept, I thought of the children of Israel. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel were guilty of spiritual straddling. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to reflect the character of Jesus. They wanted the benefits of salvation, but they weren't willing to make any changes in their own lives. One example is found in the book of 1 Kings. Take your Bibles out and come with me to the book of 1 Kings. What book did I say? First Kings. First Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. First Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. This is Elijah and he's speaking to the children of Israel. And a revival was about to occur. We need a revival today. What do you say? And it says in verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold ye between how many opinions? Between one opinion? Between how many, friends? Two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. I believe with all my heart that if Elijah was here today, he would simply say, Korean church, young, young people, how long are you going to straddle? How long are you going to spiritually multitask? Focus on one thing. Either you focus on following God or you focus on following Baal. But you cannot have both. You cannot serve two masters. Either you serve one or the other. There is no such thing as spiritual multitasking. I want a little bit of the world. I want to be saved, but I still like to be part of the world. I want to be saved, but I, I, I still like to have to dabble in, in worldly principles. Either you have God or you have the world. You cannot have both. There must be one thing that you ought to focus your spiritual life on. Jesus even repeats this concept in the book of Revelation chapter 3. Come with me to the book of Revelation chapter 3. What book are we on? Revelation chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15. Third chapter of the book of Revelation. And it reads, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that you are neither, cut, uh, neither cold nor hot. I would prefer, my King James Version says, I would that thou wert cold or hot. In other words, today's vernacular, Jesus is simply saying, look, I would prefer to you be just one thing. Either you're hot 
or you're cold, but you cannot be both. And if you decide to be both, I will spew you out of my mouth. Either you follow God or you follow Baal. Either you are a real committed Seventh-day Adventist Christian or you're not. But you cannot be both. One thing. One thing. And if you decide to be both, it's worse than being someone like out in the world. The Bible speaks of a domino effect. Every domino effect has a beginning point. What is the beginning point of this one thing? Came across this quote here, found in the pen of inspiration. It says, never forget that thoughts work out actions. Actions repeated become your what? Your habits. And your habits form your character. I've said this to you a few many times and to many of you here on a personal level. The battle of the great controversy, the battle between good and evil, is the battle over our mind. Because out of our mind come our what? Actions. Our actions repeated become our habits. Our habits become our character, and our character, as Ellen White says, determines our destiny. That's God's principles. That's God's domino effect. That's the reason why the Battle of the Great Controversy teaches us Satan is not concerned about your character. He doesn't want your character. Satan doesn't want your works. Satan's not even concerned about your destiny. The devil wants your mind. The devil wants your mind because once he has your mind, the domino effect is he has your actions, he has your habits, he has your character, and ultimately he has your destiny. And so in this domino effect, in this great controversy domino effect, where does it begin? It begins in our mind. Who has our mind? Who has your heart? Who do you love to talk about? Who do you love to post Facebook messages about? Is it about yourself or is it about God? All of these things indicate what's on your mind. The battle of the great controversy is the battle of our mind because once Jesus, once Jesus has our mind, we act like Jesus. Then we have the habits of Jesus. Then we have the character of Jesus. Then ultimately we can be like Jesus and be with him throughout all of eternity. He, uh, Romans chapter 12 amplifies this idea. It says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then it says in verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. In other words, be ye converted. Be ye revived. Where does transformation and conversion begin? By the renewing of where? Where does, where does the domino effect begin? It begins in the mind. Be transformed and renewed by your mind that ye may prove. And I underline the words prove there because in the original, the word prove is a verb. Once you are transformed with your mind that you, you are able to prove, do that which is good. Do that which is acceptable. Do the perfect will of God. But you cannot act good. You cannot act the will of God. You cannot act that which is acceptable if it doesn't begin in the renewing of your mind. Can you say amen? Who has your mind today, young people? What do you love to spend your time on? Is it the word of God? Spiritual things? Or is it other things? It begins in the mind. The battle of the great controversy. Satan wants to seal our minds. There are some examples in the Bible that are not good examples. But they are there as a warning. Because they steal away our time from focusing on one thing. I think of the man Moses, sorry, Aaron. We all know the story. When Moses went up the mountain, who was left behind? Aaron. Aaron and the children of Israel. You know the story? The children of Israel became restless, the Bible says. 
So they wanted, they, they wanted to build a calf. They wanted to, they wanted to start a religion that appeased their senses rather than a religion that appeased God. So they came to Aaron. And Aaron is a perfect example of someone who allowed apostasy into the church of God all because he had the inability to say no. He did not have the courage to stand up in front of people and say, no, this is wrong. We will not build an image of gold. And we are told in the pen of inspiration that if Aaron just simply said no, if he just simply disallowed, the apostasy would have been squelched. And it burdens my heart, young people, that so many times we see worldliness, we see worldly ideas, we see worldly practices, apostasy creep into God's church, all because there are errands in God's church who do not have the backbone and the courage to simply say no. No, we're not going to have that kind of worship. No, we're not going to teach those false ideas. No. We love, this, we love the person, but we're not going to allow those certain practices come into God's church. And a reason why there's so much confusion in the church of God, because we have people who do not have the ability to simply say no. Another example that comes to my mind is a man by the name of Pilate. Pilate knew. Pilate knew when he was standing with Jesus the Lamb of God, the Son of God. Pilate knew this was no ignorance, folks. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He knew that nothing that Jesus didn't do. He knew it. But Pilate is another example of someone who has the inability to simply stand in front of the people and say, no, we're not going to crucify this man. As a matter of fact, come with me to the book of Acts. I read this verse here. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. What book are we on? Acts. All the way in the New Testament. Acts chapter 3 and verse 13. And it reads, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom he has delivered up and has denied him in the presence of who? Friends, what's, who's that person? Pilate. When he, who's that he referring to? Pilate. When he was determined to let him go. Pilate was determined to let Jesus go. He had the right motives. He had the right thinking, but he simply could not say no. Many of us, like Pilate, will lose out in eternal salvation all because we can't say no. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to hang around these people. No, I'm not going to believe that. Another person that comes to my mind is a man by the name of Samson. Hmm? Samson lost his life all because... He couldn't say no. He wanted that Delilah. And many young people will lose out in salvation because they want the Delilahs of this world. Knowing full well that the Bible teaches to be ye not unequally yoked. The Bible teaches us, and I'm coming to a close here, the Bible teaches us in the book of Revelation. What book did I say? In the book of Revelation chapter 13. The Bible teaches us that there, was this, there is this beast power. And a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom. And the context of Revelation chapter 13 is that this beast power is a very unique power. It is a religious and it is a political power. As a matter of fact, it is a political power garbed in Christianity. And the Bible teaches us that this religious political power was wounded. And then the Bible says that this wound was healed. And the Bible says that this religious political power uh, enforced a mark. 
the mark of the beast. And the Bible says that the whole world wondered after this beast power. And the Bible teaches us that the head of this beast power is a man who has the audacity to claim to be Jesus Christ here on planet Earth. That's what the Bible teaches. And it's very interesting that the Bible says that the whole world, the whole world received the mark of the beast. Most of Christianity today will receive the mark of the beast in the end times. That's what the Bible says. And do you know the reason why they wonder after the beast? Notice what this quote says. Those who would not receive the mark of the beast and his image when the decree goes forth must have decision now to say what? No. If you don't want to receive the mark of the beast, you must, be, you must make the decision today to say no. And it must happen right now. In the little things. In the two inch sins. Because once you can say no to the two inch sins, then once the bigger sins come, it's easier to say no. If you cannot say no to the little things, what makes you think you can say no when this law is being passed? We must be faithful in saying no right now. And when we can say no right now, we can say no to the mark of the beast. Amen? And yes to the seal of God. One thing that takes us away from that focus is the inability to say no. I want to end off with this story here as I was studying a few years, not a few years, some time ago, when I was a student and I was studying pastoral evangelism, theology, I remember I was asked to preach a, uh, be one of the speakers of the school here to be uh, in the week of prayer. And uh, I asked the teacher, what is the theme? What would you like for me to preach on? And he said to me, this fo- he said to me the following words that has stuck with me even 20 years later. He says, Douglas, if there was one subject you will preach on, and that will be your last sermon, what will be that subject? You know, that that question has stuck with me 20 years later. As a matter of fact, as I prepare each sermon, I'm always asking that question. What is the one sermon? If this was my last sermon, what would it be? And I often wonder to myself as I was presenting this sermon, sometimes in order to know what God hopes for, what God desires, I found myself asking this one question. What is the one thing that Satan is afraid of the most? Because the one thing that makes Satan, the one thing that Satan is afraid of the most is probably the one thing that God hopes for the most for his people. What is the one thing that Satan fears the most? And here's the one thing. She says, there is nothing that Satan fears so much is that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance. Then she goes on to say, so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. When the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, what will come, friends? What will come? The blessing. She's talking about the latter rain here. The one thing that Satan fears the most is when we clear the way in our hearts for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Notice the domino effect. Satan knows this domino effect. Listen, friends, follow me. Follow this, follow this eschatological timeline. Satan knows that once our heart and our lives have been completely emptied of self and pride and hatred and lying and gossiping, once our hearts have been emptied of self, then the blessing of the latter rain will fall that empowers us 
to proclaim the three angels' messages with a loud cry, thus giving the whole world an opportunity between following God or following this beast power. Then the words will be said, let them that are holy be holy so let them that are righteous be righteous still. Then the time of trouble, then the second coming of Jesus, then the thousand years, then Satan, then Satan will be tormented and destroyed once and for all. And God's people will live in perfect harmony for all of eternity. But it begins, it begins with a people who are willing to empty and clear the way for the Holy Spirit. God is not waiting for another pope. God is not waiting for another president at the White House. God is not waiting for another tsunami. God is not waiting for another hurricane. God is not waiting for another earthquake. God is not waiting for another pestilence. God is waiting for his people to completely surrender to him. And once his people are completely emptied of self, then as Christ's object lessons, page 69 says, then Jesus will come through the mercy and the grace of God. If there's one thing that I believe we as Seventh-day Adventists should be focusing on, yes, we are more than a people that preaches prophecy and signs. We are a people who are willing to reflect the character of Jesus. So that when the world hears us, they not only hear the three angels' message, but they see it. That's what the world is looking for. People who will demonstrate the love of God. What's your one thing? I pray and I hope that today, our one thing will be to empty our hearts for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If that's your one thing, why don't you just raise your hand and say, Lord, I want to make this my one thing today. We cannot do it in our own power. We need the grace and the power of God. What do you say? Let us stand and sing our closing song.